Kia ora, or hello from New Zealand. My name is Christine, and hopefully you're keeping safe wherever you're listening to this presentation from. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so this is a photo actually taken from the reef of one of my study islands during spring low tide, showing a brief period of emergence. Um, and the layout of this slide, uh, actually I can't take credit for it. It's one of the recommended PowerPoint designs, but I think that it really represents a reef island well. Um, from sort of that, that aerial view, as well as um, a morphologically dynamic shoreline um, that is a form of resilience to changing conditions. Um, so I'll be talking about another type of resilience, ecological resilience in terms of sediment supply in reef islands in response to rising sea level on Hubudu Atoll in the Maldives. So reef islands, especially as portrayed in the media, are at the forefront of concern for future accelerating sea level rise, since their low-lying and isolated nature puts them at higher risk of marine inundation compared to continental coastlines. And you can see here, um, they are quite low-lying. So this is one of the smaller sand caves from Huvudu Atoll. Um, and even on my study islands, um, I didn't measure a point on the islands higher than two and a half meters above mean sea level. Um, and also these islands are solely built up from sediment from their surrounding reef, um, which in itself is a vulnerable ecosystem. Um, further with climate change, you get more extreme storm events, which could also present another risk to reef islands. However, submersion as implied by future projected sea level rise and current island elevations don't consider um, the morphological resilient nature of these reef island systems and the role of sediment supply in the resilience of these islands is still relatively poorly studied. So by investigating down core sediment characteristics, um, this can provide insights into past sediment supply, reef ecology, and depositional environments. So that brings me to the objectives of this study, which is to present detailed descriptions of the sedimentary characteristics and stratigraphy of two lagoonal platform, or sorry, platform islands in Huvudu Atoll, Maldives, um, in order to provide some of these insights into the sedimentological changes that occurred during island development. So the islands are located in the Maldives, which is an archipelago that straddles um, the equator and in the Indian Ocean. And my study atoll is in the south part of this archipelago. And the two islands that I looked at are Kandahalagala and Kande Mati Labadu, um, which will be in the rest of this presentation referred to as Can and Kond. So in order to study the subsurface stratigraphy of these islands, um, we use percussion coring. Um, which is shown in this picture here. It would have been nice to have a, a vibra core, but of course, logistically on these remote islands, it's really difficult to um, ship in heavy machinery. So the heavy machinery really just was our, our arms and a big hammer. Um, so the transects and the core locations are shown on these maps. Um, I'm going to be showing you um, some core logs from transect three, that mid transect on CAN, um, since I can't show all of the data. Um, from these cores that we extracted, um, we took samples from where there was a visible change in sediment characteristics. These were sieved into 14 different size fractions and each size fraction was analyzed for composition. Um, and as well, we took 41 halomita segments. So um, on the bottom left picture there, there's a scanning electron microscope um, image of halomita to make sure that what we're sending in is pristine. Um, as well as six bulk sand samples and three aquapora branches uh, were sent in for AMS and conventional radiocarbon dating. So the results um, from our sedimentological um, studies was that the island sediments were dominated by coral sands. Um, so we found in the samples that coral was the primary constituent, ranging from 41.1% from to 91.8%. Um, and then we had a varying amount of the secondary constituents that were comprised of mollusks, halomita, foraminifera, and crustose coralline algae, which incidentally was what was growing on the reef at the time, um, as well as found in the reefal sediment. So through principal component analysis, as well as k-means cluster analysis, um, the samples were also grouped into four statistically distinct clusters 
And within these clusters, there's a variation as well in Halimeda um, from 4.3% to 12.7% on CAN and 3.8% to um, a really high 32.8% on COND. And there was also a variation in mollusks as well. Um, so increasing from 8.3 to 28.4% on CAN and 7.3 to 18.2% on COND. Um, and these clusters that had higher proportions of halomita and mollusks, they tended to be found um, lower down in the islands um, or deeper in the cores. Um, so we're seeing these down core variations with increasing proportion of mollusks and halomita with depth, um, with the exception of the cores that terminated on lagoon infill or a basal layer of coral sticks in a coarse sand matrix. Um, and dating this basal layer, um, so on Ken, that basal layer was deposited around 2,500 years ago, and on Cond, it was about 3,000 years ago. Um, and this is that mid transect for, for Ken. Uh, and we actually were finding um, a layer of coral reef that was probably overtopped when the island um, was shifting south on its platform. So, again, some, some morphological. Um, resilience in terms of how, how it, it's dynamic and it moves around to changing conditions. Um, so in general, the dates constrain continuing island development in both Ken and Con um, to between 2000 and 400 years um, ago. So what's happening there in terms of sedimentological changes and what's causing these changes? Um, so first, if we look at sea level history in the region, there is evidence of a mid to late Holocene high stand. So this is when sea level was higher than it is currently, um, occurring around 4,000 to 2,100 years ago. So this uh, could have provided a high energy window um, for that lagoon infill that initiated island development. So that basal layer of coral sticks. And this is typical of other Maldivian islands as well. Um, and then over the past 2,000 years, this is where it gets a bit complicated, and um, we didn't have any coral evidence um, from the last 1,800 years until a recent study um, by Kench and others from fossil microatoll evidence showing large oscillations in sea level behavior, which includes two low stands where sea level was below what it currently is now. So um, what could have been happening is that increased proportion of halomeda and mollusks in island deposits during these oscillations um, could be due to during the sea level falls, there could have been a mo coral mortality. And we do see this in contemporary events like um, and so El Nino rapid sea level fall, where we do have coral dieback. Um, in short term, that actually does contribute to some um, sediment supply, uh, but of course not sustainable in, in the long term. Um, and that, and so, so the contemporary events we're seeing happens um, on decadal uh, swings, whereas the sea level curve shows oscillations occurring over centuries. So the time scale is a bit different. Something else that could be happening is the catch up growth strategy of the reef during sea level rises. Um, and we would expect to find more halomeda and mollusks because they have higher turnover rates and um, also directly contribute to sediment production after death. Um, so the reef currently would um, have to continue to employ this catch-up strategy because we do have a current sea level trajectory at Huvudu Atoll of a rise of 4.24 millimeters per year. Um, and we do have sedimentological evidence as well to show that um, the island is still connected with the, the reef. So um, the reef is still producing sediments that is being stored in the sand moat and is available for beach nourishment. So just some take home messages here. Um, the sedimentological response of increased halomeda and mollusks really highlights the resilient and dynamic nature of reef islands. Um, and reef island interaction with sea level is complex and sea level rise doesn't necessarily uh, mean that it'll be detrimental to the islands. Um, because this research shows that their reefs are able, so the island reefs are able to adjust ecologically to rising or oscillating sea levels. Um, so keeping that in mind, there are of course different things going on now, like human factors um, that wouldn't have, uh, the islands wouldn't have had to contend with during development. Um, and on that note, the human factors, there are populated islands that would be vulnerable 
um, to other threats such as freshwater contamination um, and coastal inundation of infrastructure, infrastructure even if the, the islands themselves are physically persistent. So um, on that note, just some final thoughts. And since this is a coastal engineering conference, um, that care should be taken not to disrupt this natural sediment co connectivity and also the idea of recognizing reefs as natural infrastructure. Um, and that's my presentation. Thank you very much. And please let me know if you have any questions and you can also email me.